So T. Boy joins us today from her home in Oakland, California, and her position in the Comics MFA program at the California College of Arts. Her journey is one that began in Vietnam in the 1970s, and then really crossed the world um, in dramatic fashion, from the Pulau Bissar refugee camp in Malaysia, onto Indiana, that's a shift, <laughs> and then onto California. She attended UC Berkeley for her undergraduate degree, where she received degrees in art and legal studies. And you really sort of see the intersection of those and the works that she's doing today. Um, the research that she's been doing for her recent creative work has brought her to uh, the Greek island of Lesbos and to immigrant detention centers across the United States, where she is currently documenting and advocating on behalf of incarcerated immigrants and asylum seekers. Recently, the East Bay Express described Tibui as the best graphic novelist fighting for the underdog. And I think that the world needs people fighting for underdogs right now. Her work is incredibly timely and important at this moment. So using the power of her pen, or as we might say, like her stylus, <laughs> she is also using her words and her art to document experiences and voices that are often silenced, but that are vital for understanding the deep and lasting consequences of war and displacement. Tibui's critically acclaimed 27 debut graphic novel, The Best You Could Do, has been awarded many literary prizes. She's won the American Book Award, was finalist for the National Book Critics Circle for Autobiography, and finalist for the Eisner Award in Reality-Based Comics. She's been on a number of best of lists for books, including that of Bill Gates, as well as the AV Club and many others. The power of her cartoons has really been multiplied in the open and critical discussions that she's been engaged in across cities and across universities all over the country, and in the really active and resisting social media presence that she has cultivated. So her memoir really bears witness to one family's journey, her own, but it's bringing into view how Vietnamese, Vietnamese Americans, women and children experienced wars in Vietnam and still do experience those. Um, last but not least, for, especially for this group and our, and our location here, um, Thi Bui is an educator and an advocate. She's the founding teacher of, one of the founding teachers of Oakland International High School, where for seven years she taught English language learning immigrant and refugee students. She shared with them the craft of illustration and storytelling, and she worked with her students on an autobiographical comics project called We Are Oakland International, which features their drawings and words and gives voices to their perspective and really brings dignity to the struggle they faced. So creative voices, like those of Tibui, invite reflection. They create compassion, and they also ignite resistance. Um, they also spark conversations, and I understand there's going to be some good conversation after. Lots of um, questions and answers will be welcome. Um, Tibui creates with a goal, as she has stated, to amplify, amplify voices that are less heard and engage people in conversations that need to be had. And we are really fortunate to be part of that ongoing conversation today. So welcome to you all, and um, I want to uh, please have you welcome uh, T. Bui to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm happy to see you here. Um, <clears throat> my book is called The Best We Could Do. My name is T. Bui. Um, that the little one in the picture is me, which you know already from reading the book. So my family looked like that when we were both people, um, but that was like a very short window of our lives. We were, you know, just regular people in Vietnam. We were an ordinary family in Vietnam, but the country was not ordinary at the time. The country was in the middle of a very long civil war, and that changed everything for us. We couldn't live there anymore after a while. So we had to find a new home, and that was complicated. So now I'm here, and I have a very nice life. Uh, I get to be a writer now. But um, it's been a long journey to get here. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm also happy to answer your questions. 
Um, but first, I just wanted to talk about how identity is really complicated here in the US because we're in the middle of a weird time where um, some people are trying to define American as one thing. And then those of us who are here are like, uh, American is a lot of things, right? There's a thousand Americas. So um, I think it's a really important time for everybody who lives here to look really hard around them and to get to know their neighbors better and to understand who they are in more, in more complex ways because we each carry so many different histories in us. But that's a good thing. Like we're a really special country if we can accept all of these differences because the world has come to one place and if we can figure out how to share space and live together, we are a very, very interesting experiment in the future of the world. Um, <clears throat> so I want to read to you a uh, part of the book and I'm going to need help from three people. And I know it's early, but it's, it's earlier in California. <laughs> so I'm, I had two cups of coffee, and I'm going to try. So um, the first person that I need, uh, I need somebody, uh, any gender, to read the voice of my father, Bo. And you're going to read his voice when he was a young man, when he was an old man. And then, if it's OK with you, I also need the same person to read the sound effects. Anybody want to do it? Great. I'm going to give you a microphone. Or if, um, can you get a microphone? And then, uh, what's your name? Brianna. Brianna, thank you. Okay, here's a slightly smaller part. Uh, if someone could read Bo's grandfather, and the small part as the neighbor. Yeah? You'll do it? What's your name? Abby. Abby? Okay, great. You're going to get a microphone, too. And then the last part is uh, a little bit more complicated. I'm going to need this person. Oh, thank you. I'm going to need this person to play uh, Paul's grandmother, who's kind of a grumpy woman, and uh, my sister, Lan. And my mother, Ma. Anybody feeling very awake? Okay, great. What's your name? Fatima. Thank you. Yeah, one last microphone for you. Okay, so, um, you know, the, the story is described as being very serious, but there are funny parts because it's life. Uh, so feel free to, to laugh if you feel like it. Um, I do a lot, and it helps. <laughs> So I'm going to take you back across time and space to a South Vietnam that no longer exists. The year is 1955, so a long time ago. I wasn't alive yet, but my father was a kid. Uh, he was, uh, anybody, anybody 14, 15 here? So he was your age, my father. And he had just left the only place he had ever lived in North Vietnam and made a gamble to go to South Vietnam to start a new life because the country was changing and he wanted a brighter future. Garçon, 
and visited friends and relatives. When his grandfather wanted some time away from him, here's some money, go see a movie. Bo's grandmother arrived in Saigon separately on the last of the great ships from the north. Grandma! <laughs> Let's make a new home together. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I don't need you. Bo's grandmother rented a flat with two other women. This, ma this way, auntie. But fate would soon drive her back to her unfaithful husband. The South had a new prime minister named Ho Ding Zia, who had yet to establish full control of the region. Saigon had its own mafia, called the Bing Suiyan, who controlled the casinos, the brothels, and the drug trade. Zip's forces fought the big swing in the streets of Saigon. One night, the fighting came right to the doorstep of Bo's grandmother. Ow! Ow, oh, my opening, my opening jars. Stay down. With her securities gone and scared of more violence, Bo's grandmother agreed to go back to her cheating husband. <sighs> huh? Grandma? And Bo had a family again. They pulled their money together and bought a little house for the equivalent of $5,000. Uh, $5,000 seems really cheap for a house in the capital. It was really just the space between two other houses. Uh, wait, I've got paper. Can you draw it for me? Someone had topped it with a roof made of palm leaves. Inside they lined it with cardboard to give it the semblance of a house. But to me, at age 14, it was a home and a dress. This is the house I lived in, only a lot later. Yes, but by that time, they had added another story to it. It was still small and dirty. Do you remember it? No, it was too little. My first home. I went to see the old house uh, with my family in 2001, the time that Bo refused to go. Travis and I were newlyweds. I had an impulsive short haircut. <laughs> <laughs> The street had changed beyond recognition. Miraculously, an old neighbor still lived there, recognized my mother, and came out to talk to us. I'll read this is you. Uh, aren't you Nan's wife? Aren't you Nan's wife? There, there, that's your house. Oh, oh, I, I thought the it, it was that one. Oh, I did just that one. That was Mr. Collins' house. Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Kent lived in that house, in that one. No, that's Mrs. Daw. He's right, ma'am. Uh, uh, that's... Uh, that's right, B. This is our house. We each had our own reaction to this homecoming. Lan already scouting ahead. Ma and Big, the most excited. Me and them documenting and low remembering. We didn't know the people there and we didn't go inside. 
even standing right in front of our old home, I had to rely on other people's stories to picture how it was when we lived there. I think this is the sun shop where occasionally we would get a cigarette or two for that. This is where we learned to ride our bikes from there, all the way to there, without hitting any of the vendors. This is the old camp house where we would go out every day with our little glass and bring back some coffee for dad. With the condensed milk. Less with option. <laughs> <laughs> Smells really good. Quick. Lam and Vic remember the alley where a friend lived. Lamp post that Lamb walked into while reading. <laughs> In the sidewalk where Big beat up a boy for harassing Lamb. <laughs> Clucking memories of my own. I do research. Lots of research. Hello, Big. I brought you a video I found. Vietnam War with Walter Cronkite? The narration is only okay. But what I thought was neat was seeing footage of our old neighborhood. Really? Thank you, Bo. Mmm, if you like it, I'll get you more. caricature, but lacking memories of my own, I have to depend on other people's stories. The Lower East Side, I'll draw it like that. I still have the chessboard my father made when I was a kid and the wooden set of pieces that we played with. Revisiting this game of war and strategy, I think about how none of the Vietnamese people in that video have a name or a voice. My grandparents, my parents, my sisters, and me, we weren't any of the pieces on the chessboard. We were more like ants scrambling out of the way of giants getting just far enough away from danger to resume the business of living. Thank you to the amazing readers. You did a great job. So, um, Not long after I finished um, the best we could do before it went to print, I uh, got to illustrate a, another Vietnamese American refugee story, but it was for children, and so I had a lot less words and a lot more pictures. Um, but it was also about a father and son or parent and child relationship. Um, and because I, I, I couldn't use any words. I had to do a lot with the body language of these two people to show their relationship. Um, to show what does it look like when two people are, are close and clearly love each other, but maybe they not so clearly love each other too. And what does it look like for a little kid when he doesn't quite understand why his dad is so sad 
all the time. And um, when he talks about things that are from long ago in a, in a country far away, um, what that feels like for the little boy. And then also like what daily life looks like uh, when you're a new, a new arrival in the US and you don't have a lot of stuff yet. Um, what are the things that make home look like home? For us, uh, it was like the, the free calendar from the supermarket. That would be the only decoration on the wall. Uh, it was also like the, the hand-me-down clothes from the 1970s that we wore in the 1980s. Or that the, the light bulb was there. Um, Kim talked about some of my more recent work uh, with uh, people who came as refugees and then ended up in immigration detention after spending a long time in prison. Um, the Yi Nguyen is one of the earliest people that I drew um, and I was drawn to his case because his crime was very, very old and it was pretty minor. Uh, no one was hurt, um, but he was um, going in for an ICE check-in one day. Actually, he wasn't even going in for an ICE check-in. The ICE officers showed up at his house and lied to his family and said they were just bringing him in for some paperwork. And uh, his wife, they sent his wife upstairs to go get his jacket, and then they left before she could come back down. And he had a five-month-old baby at the time uh, that they took him away. Um, and he is just one of like 10,000 uh, Vietnamese Americans in the U.S. Um, in danger of being deported for very old crimes who came before 1995. Um, so, you know, one of the things that his wife Tammy told me that she was really terrified about was the idea that he could get taken away from his family and that she would raise their baby alone. Um, and one of the sad things about Yi's life was that he was also raised by a single mom um, because he got separated from his dad. So the cycle of um, the, the, the cycle of like suffering can go all the way back to the Vietnam War, even though it ended a long time ago um, through things like the laws that we have today that make um, this kind of, we call it double jeopardy, like when you get punished twice for the same crime. So Yi already spent time in jail for his crime, but because he wasn't born in this country, he can get punished twice. So they make you finish your sentence in, in jail or prison, and then they transfer you to ICE detention, and then you can get deported to a country that maybe you left as a refugee, or maybe you weren't even born in because your parents fled that country as a refugee and were born along the way. And this is another family. Um, they're uh, a Montagnard family from Vietnam. Montagnards are an ethnic minority um, who fought on the side of the US. So um, it's like actually really awful to send somebody back to a country where they were like fighting on the opposite side. Um, and this is a family who's already lost their husband and, and, and father, um, but they are fighting uh, through legal means to bring him back. And I just want you to hear a little bit of their voices. For all of the support and the um, kindness and the generosity that you guys have been given to me and my family, we appreciate um, all the effort that you guys have put in, um, especially for those who have supported me and my family to bring um, their father back home. We hope that this process does work and that everything goes well um, for me and my kids. This is very important for us and we hope that um, he would be able to come back to reunite with us. Thank you so much for all your time and generosity. We appreciate this very much. Thank you. Thank you for our support. Thank you for our donations. Thank you for bringing our dad back. Thank you. Bye. Bye. If you want to find more out, uh, find out more about the family, this is the, um, the URL that I gave. So um, how did these people who came as refugees of war end up begging uh, to not be separated from their families and sent thousands of miles away from the ones that they love? So this question um, led me down a path of research where I'm learning a lot 
about America and its history and the history of resettlement in the U.S. Um, I learned that a lot of uh, refugee families were settled in places with high poverty, high crime, not very good schools, um, a lot of gangs, um, a lot of bullying, and not enough services to help people. Um, and then on top of that, the U.S. is actually a really violent country. So many refugees who were fleeing very violent countries came to the U.S. and experienced things like school shootings. Uh, PJ, or Bori I is his real name, uh, he's, um, he is one of the Cambodian guys who I have been uh, interviewing a lot. And when he was little, in the first grade, he experienced one of the first um, very famous school shootings in the U.S. that happened in Stockton, California. And it was a man, of course with mental illness, but he was targeting specifically refugees. So he came to school with primarily Southeast Asian refugees and he shot on the playground. And he killed a bunch of little kids. Uh, one of them was PJ's cousin, who he saw fall. Um, so this, this, this shooting happened a long time ago, but it's still, it's still remembered in this town when you go there. But, uh, so a few years after that, uh, PJ got a little bit older, and he's, he's scarred by this incident, and he's scarred by, he's like scared about, about all the bullying that he experiences in school too, so he seeks safety, because uh, there's not a lot of security in his family, he seeks safety in, in, in a gang. Um, and then the gang pulls him into a robbery, and the robbery goes wrong. So at the age of 16, he um, found out that the, uh, the, the robbery that he ran away from after his gun went off on accident actually killed the shop owner. So he turned himself in, and he became one of the youngest uh, kids to be sentenced as an adult in California, and he went away for a long time. He spent 20-something years in prison, and then was transferred immediately to ICE, and then now has an order of removal, which means the U.S. wants to deport him to Cambodia, where he's actually never been, because he was a baby in his mom's belly when she was fleeing the Khmer Rouge. Um, and she was running away from Cambodia because she saw her father and her husband butchered in front of her eyes. She ran away by herself, pregnant, to a refugee camp in Thailand when PJ was born. So, um, <laughs> It's some heavy stories that are going into this book called Nowhere Land. Um, but one of the things that I've also learned from working uh, with guys who've gone to prison, and some women who've gone to prison, is that um, this idea that I had before that life is over if you go to prison is actually not true. Like when I was a teacher, if my, you know, I actually, I was a high school teacher for like 10 years. Um, and if one of my students went to jail, I would have felt like, oh no, I failed him, or I failed her, and that's it. I think we made a mistake and, and it can't be fixed. But what I learned from these guys is they all went to prison when they were very young, but life went on for them, and they found um, friends and a reason for living. They got their high school degrees, some of them got college degrees, some of them are out now, and they have families, and uh, they've been helping people since, like, they were in prison. So um, they're actually some of the strongest and most inspiring people that I've ever met. And, and the guys especially really surprised me in how enlightened they are. That they, they have gone through hell, but they've worked through a lot of issues, and they are the best people, I think, to be helping other people not go down the same path. So we need them as a society, and yet, at the same time, we're trying to send them away. So it doesn't make any sense to me, um, and, and, and that's part of why I'm writing this book. So I, I want to share with you a quote from one of them. His name is Lee. He said about the organization that he volunteers with, uh, which is called Asian Prisoners Support Committee. He says, we invest in people. We believe in the goodness that exists in people because we were also a group of people who waited 20 to 30 years, some longer, for others to invest in us, to see the value in us. We as a whole society can move humanity forward through how we show up and what we do for one another. 
when you contrast that with um, with other folks who are, you know, on paper they're like law-abiding citizens, but they're just out to make money for themselves. Um, you think about well, who's better for humanity? It's like the answer is clear to me. Oh, I want to go back for a second. So I just wanted to say um, that. I think I figured out what my philosophy of living is after all these years. Um, is, uh, so I, I, I marched in the Women's March like two, three years ago. And like at the time, people were, were really angry and they had all these like, great signs that said like, pussy grabs back and stuff like that, like, you know, very exciting signs. And mine just said, um, mine said, take care of the earth and each other. And I think it was a little bit mild of a statement <coughs> at the time, because people looked at, they looked at my sign and they were like, oh. But three years later, like it still holds true. Like this is what I believe. That this is what I want for humanity. It's like for us to take better care of each other, and to take better care of this planet. Um, and I just want everybody to be okay, which requires looking very hard at when things are not okay and figuring out why, and then also believing that I have some some say, so that I have some power to affect change, and that we all have power that maybe we don't realize we have to change things. Um, but I want to go back a second to the parent-child relationships that I was talking about earlier, because at the same time as like I'm doing all this work outside with prisoners and refugees and climate change, I have a kid, and he's 13 years old, um, he's homesick right now, which makes me feel really, really guilty as his mom. Um, he's in high school now, though, so you know he can take care of himself. Um, but uh, one of the ways that I figured out how to balance my work with being a parent is to enroll my son in making a book with me. So we actually got to make a book that's coming out next week. It's coming out November 12th. It's called Chicken of the Sea. And he did the drawings for it. It's written by actually a really famous writer and his son uh, named Viet Tan Nguyen. Uh, so Viet has won like a Pulitzer Prize. He won a MacArthur. He won a bunch of stuff. Um, and his son is six years old now. He was five years old at the time he came up with the idea for this book called Chicken of the Sea. And it's about chickens who get bored living on a farm so they become pirates. <laughs> And I never would have come up with this idea because Vietnamese people are terrified of pirates. Um, but clearly our kids are okay. Uh, and then like they asked me if I wanted to illustrate it and I was like, I'm kind of busy with this book about like detention centers. Um, but my son actually has like a really similar like artistic sensibility. So maybe he could do some sketches and you guys could look at it. And he did it and they loved it. So we all four worked together. Um, Viet and it, like took Allison's ideas and his like original comic, which was like you know scrawled on the back of some computer paper with some markers, and we had, like uh, rewrote it in free verse and um, made it a really cool manuscript. Uh, and then I took it and helped my son like break it up into pages, and then he did the uh, he did oops, he did the line art, which looks like that, and then um, I colored it with my stylus on my iPad. And now it looks more like this. And that, <laughs> that's me and my son Ian and uh, little, little Ellison and Viet. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the other person that I feel kind of guilty about leaving because she's also sick is my mom. Um, this is her uh, when she was still dying her hair black. Uh, I think probably a couple years ago. This is like when the first when the book first came out, and I uh, dragged her along to a couple of events. She, um, I think she helped me. Um, I think she was helping me sell the books at this one event in Oakland. And uh, it's weird for her at first, I think, because she was in the book, and then to be meeting people, going, "Yeah, that's me." <laughs> it made me realize how generous my mom was in letting me tell her story and trusting me with that. Um, there was one event at Stanford 
that she came to because I needed a little bookseller, so she came to swipe the credit cards, right? And uh, somebody always asks me, how did your mother feel about this book? And I said, well, my mother's here, let's ask her. And so my mother, my mother stands up and she goes, well, we told you the truth and she wrote down whatever she wanted. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> like, Trying to tell me, Mom. <laughs> Showed you rough drafts, you know. Um, but then later, when she was when when the book lab was happening, when she was swiping the credit cards, she I heard her tell somebody the book is ninety nine percent true. So I don't know which one it is. Like my mother has conflicting stories. I think I think that she does. And this is my mother now in her silver fox hair. Um, and we recently went to a show by another Vietnamese American woman um, whose mother came to the US as a refugee. And this is like a one woman play. It's really intense because it's about how her mother died when she was 11 years old in a, in a botched plastic surgery operation. So this is, like, this is like her way of processing her grief for this mom that she lost. And the last words she said to her mom were like, I hate you because they were fighting. Um, so it was a big deal for um, for her to perform uh, to like other folks like her who understand like this heaviness. And then I thought it was great that she also met my mom. And my mom, my mom is like such a great mom to everybody else. <laughs> she you know, she gives all the good parts of being and, and, and none of the baggage. So I, I love lending her out. <laughs> and it's it's been a long time now since the book has come back, come out, and it's been a long time since like all of those conversations that I had that I had with her, where I sat her down and made her tell me the stories over and over again. She was very patient with me at the time, answering all these questions about life long ago and the war and all of that. Um, and the book. You know, it's not a memoir in the sense of like, I had this amazing life and I'm gonna sit down and tell you about it. It's more like the book was a vehicle, it was an excuse for me to ask my parents a lot of questions to figure out who I am, where I come from. And it was also a place for me to put things that I yearn for, just to be closer to my parents and to love them better. <coughs> so these hugs don't happen a lot in your life, but once you put them in your art, they last forever. And you can go back in time and thank your mother um, on paper <laughs> in a way that's easier in some ways than in real life. And with my dad, you know, we had this understanding of each other that we didn't have before. So I feel like we're, we're at peace with each other in a lot of ways. I'm really grateful to the book for that. And then ultimately, the next test is uh, me and my son. So when he was 10 and I was finishing up the book, I was like, oh, I think we're good. Like, I don't see any PTSD in him. I don't see any intergenerational trauma in him. And then he turned 13. <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried all over again. Because um, that stuff is real, and uh, being 13 is hard. And being a parent who grew up poor and as a refugee is real hard when when your kid grew up, you know, middle class in Berkeley. Sometimes I want to yell at him, um, but like I'm like, but I created these circumstances for him, you know. So parenting is the hardest job ever, and making the book and becoming a parent at the same time has given me this understanding and this empathy for my parents that I never had before. And at the same time, I think I wrote a better book than they would have written. Because if my mother had written the book, it would have been, we went through all this hardship and sacrificed everything so that our kids could have everything, so they should be more perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, like that whole, arc of like the immigrant story where you overcome all these obstacles to come to America and then life is happily ever after, and that's not how it works. Life goes on and it's hard in different ways that maybe your parents won't understand. So that's part, that's part of like the, the 
the gap, right, between your experience and your parents' experience. 